Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Inner Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called When Earth Broke, written by Dark Prince 010. It was in the twilight of the third millennium AD, after humanity, by and large, thought that its extensiality was no longer at risk, that Earth itself began to churn. Vibration. Rumbles and magnetic eruptions sprouted across not just the active plates, but seemingly along every seam on the planet's crust. The bafflement of scientists, rather than amusing and satisfying those who wished to remain ignorant as in ages before, now terrified the enlightened but uncertain masses. Our people were only a few centuries into rebuilding, recovering from a thousand unbroken years of extraction, production, and devastation. But with each passing year, the quaking grew, and the danger and consequences to those caught in the natural disasters became more and more dire. It was into this period of despair, one that felt cruel and unearned, given how far we had come from self-destruction, we had nearly called upon ourselves. We thought that we had been granted a gift, a reward for our declaration. A single vessel from beyond our solar system arrived, and while wary, we greeted it with peace and curiosity rather than fear and violence. Our reward for this caution was the voice of the envoy who had traveled to reach us. It was a creature with properties akin to both slime molds and aquatic invertebrates, and their appearance was unusual, even unsettling to some. Communication proved difficult and took some months as their kind used direct bioelectric impulses along mated tendrils rather than clumsy acoustic waves sent through mere air and media. But with patience and urgency in equal measure, we managed to bridge the gap of communication and learn that the creatures called itself gateway or portal, depending on the interpretation of specific impulse signatures. They said they traveled from a star cluster near the edge of the universe, a system some billions of years older than ours. We hoped they had wisdom to offer, and our hopes were revived when Gates spoke of a bubbling, crackling, and quaking that had occurred on their home planet nearly a quarter of a million years prior. But rather than offering news or hope, they revealed a doomed prophecy. For within our planet, what we thought we knew of our composition beneath Earth's surface was wrong. There was heat, it was not just that of pressure and friction. It was the heat of a xenobiological processes. There was magma, but it was not mere rock and metal. It was lifeblood and yolk. There were strings of movement, but they were not just tectonic shifts or the spinning metal core. They were the stirrings of a creature older and larger than any being our planet had ever known. A creature beyond anything that we could ever imagine possible. Our world was not our own, but merely the shell of an egg that was beginning to hatch. Gate was apologetic for this news, and said that after such a devastation nearly wiped out their kind, they had pledged themselves to travel to all such planets harboring intelligent species, to offer them a chance to escape before facing decimation and annihilation once the hatching began in earnest. We were told there were others, Others who had followed in their footsteps and fled, and others who had instead sought to beseech the entity within, hoping for salvation and power. But when we asked if any had tried to fight back, the question was regarded as impossible. It was like fighting a god to kill the unkettable, and few they'd spoken to had dared to try. Instead, they had to watch helplessly as the titanic behemoths left to find new planets to seed and to doom any life that might emerge upon it in later eons. Well, I don't need to tell you that humanity is a bit more stubborn and creative when facing down a threat. We had risen to the occasion when our very biosphere was on the brink, clawing back a measure of habitability and growth, and all hope had seemed lost before. So now we had a new unified threat, a new unified task to stand behind. Centuries before, humanity had stood firm against its own destruction, and now we began to devise how we could escape it once more. Gate was surprised at our willingness to stay 
and fight, but gladly offered whatever aid they could. Little by little, we dug deeper into the mystery that lay beneath our feet. Painstakingly, even with parts of our planet beginning to shake themselves into mere rubble, we made tiny slivers of headway. An international group of nations and space forces managed to develop a fleet of ships capable of evacuating as many as possible in advance of the inevitable destruction. Our methods of slowing or stopping the creature before Earth was consumed looked to have little chance of being ready in time. The fleet could fold the paltry amount less than half the population, with a lucky chosen by lottery for the most part. The gate was still astounded and congratulated us, as his own species had been decimated to less than one in a hundred individuals, making it off their planet cracked and burned. But still, we tried, we searched, we looked, even as the ships began to load and fly off world. Small possibilities, ideas, experiments. A mismatch that showed some promise, but no more. And still, the Earth continued to break. Finally, nearly three decades after Gate arrived with their warning and condolences, the day came. The Earth shook with force, the last few escape craft managing to make it off world just before the tumultuous ejection of chunks of crust and mantle would have made successful departure impossible. But as we pulled back and as the first glimpses of the newborn god became visible, we initiated our final gambit. As the last remnants of humanity ignited deep space engines preparing to accelerate beyond the speed of light, we engaged the engines of our last resort, a project codenamed Stone's Throw. It was a work of countless factories and enrichment facilities across the planet, isolating and amplifying heavy elements, radioactive material, and even a few magnetically shielded antimatter payloads. As much volatile, reactive, and dangerous material as we could possibly afford to spare, aside from the resources needed for the escape fleet. Gate had admired our zeal, but warned us that such weapons were only a tiny fraction of what would be necessary to kill a god. We would be lucky if we were able to draw so much as a single drop of celestial blood. They warned us that their own kind had done similarly. Every weapon and explosive, every railgun and mass driver were targeted on a single point, and all they produced was a single city-sized drop of ichor before the sting angered their god, and the offending weapon arrays were wiped out along with nearly half of their initial survivors. We thanked them for their impact but continued on with another goal in mind. As the array of armaments had been placed in a bunker drilled several kilometers below the surface of our own moon, on the other end of the soon-to-be orphan planetoid, we built hundreds of engines, enormous brethren to those powering our fleet of escaping ships. As the fleet jumped, our final observer probes were activated, relaying images of our burned and dead planet, flaking away from the slowly but inevitably uncurling mass within. Gate again commented that placing such weaponry within the mass of an object like the moon was an ingenious improvement, but still not likely to do more than anger the godling, as their people had discovered before. Humanity paid them polite but little heed, as we engaged the moon and began flying it in the direction of the slowly shifting shape. The fleet had just arrived at the regrouping point outside of our Oort cloud, a safety point to allow time for the full charge needed to leap to a habitable systems we had identified as a possible replacement home. But as we watched the probe's broadcasts of the moon hurtling towards some possibly huge Aldrich shape, the moon soared past, missing an outstretched continental tentacle by a few hundred thousand miles. Gate, for their part, was surprised and apologetic to the extreme as they understood that turning such a massive projectile would be almost impossible. To observing leaders and scientists, they said sorrowfully, it was the worst of lucks that you missed. But at last, we knew there was no changing the course of action, and so the final project stone fur was revealed, simply telling the alien emissary, we were aiming for the god. A few hours later, having accelerated to an impressive speed, the moon impacted our own sun once worshipped as a god itself by humans too young to know better. With our own pen, we had pricked and burst the form of our star. As anticipated and calculated, 
It spilled forth nearly all of its fusion and fury in a narrow path, the one occupied by the thing that had most recently been the center of our home world. But creatures of that scale do not move quickly, not nearly quickly enough. It resisted for an hour, burned for a second hour, and began to die by the third. By the time our probes had become too damaged to transmit a signal any longer, it was clear that the god was now little more than burnt scraps of titanic dead flesh. In the days to come, Gate would depart with their craft, heading back to their refugee fleet, so that a new message could be spread amongst their people, a message of hope. Not as a god that killed their world, but as a world that killed their god of humanity. The first God Slayers. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Bushmaster 177, Henry the Red, Casper Arnholtz, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Elijah Silvercross, Dragzoon WRE, and Severin Cerberus. Thank you very much.